Uh, Josh, you said at the beginning that um, the triennial cycle, which itself is not, is a bit of a, it's a slightly inappropriate word. We don't have a better one, but it, if it's taken to imply that there's something special about three years or three and a half years or three and a quarter years, that's not correct. The, uh, the basic point is that Chazal set originally, or you might even say pre-Chazal, um, the Chachamim of the Torah of Ezra Sofer, set a certain amount of Torah to read each week based upon how much people can be expected to read uh, and internalize and understand. And it falls out that if you read that much, it comes out about three years. And if you take, and depending on when Shabbos falls on Yom Tov and uh, if Rosh Chodesh is this, or blah, 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 it might be a bit more, it might be a bit less. You can divide it up a bit more, you can divide it up a bit less. There's nothing special about three and a half years but, or three years, in fact. Um, and, but there's one more thing, which is that uh, it's very true, of course, that it was established by the Chachamim of uh, Eretz Israel, but that shouldn't be taken to imply that it's, it's only for Eretz Israel or it's specifically for Eretz Israel. Uh, when Chazal established this reading, their assumption, as far as anyone knows, and there's no reason to think otherwise, was, was Jews wherever they should be, if unfortunately, for whatever reason, they're not uh, home in Eretz Israel, should also be reading a triennial cycle. Um, and you could even argue that, the, that one of the benefits of a triennial cycle, which is that it allows you to study a more manageable uh, portion each week, is even more relevant to those of you who, uh, for the time being, are not here, because the timetable for the annual cycle is even more cramped um, in Chutzlaret because of having more yontas that fall, as a rule, not always, but as a rule, having more yontas that fall on Shabbos than, uh, than we do here. But the point I'm, I'm getting at is that there are, there's a distinction that everyone knows. There are halachos for people who live in Chutzaret and there are halachos for people who live here in Eretz Yisrael. But that is not the same thing as the distinction between Torah Eretz Yisrael and Torah Bavel. The distinction between living here and living somewhere else exists in both of them and exists in a different way than both of them. And unfortunately, uh, the, the case, the reality is that as Jews have come back home, in very many, many, many cases, though they have adopted halachos of Eretz Yisrael, what they've been bringing back is davka, the Torah of Bavel, and not the Torah of Eretz Yisrael. It's a very good example. We all just had this sukkus, which is tefillin on Cholomoed. All the sources from Eretz Yisrael say you're supposed to wear tefillin on Cholomoed. They either imply it very strongly or they say so explicitly like the Yerushalmi. And it's only... In Bavel, I mean, the Bavli doesn't say anything, but it's only in Bavel that this idea that you shouldn't even arose. And it was in Spain that it seems to have become more common in certain quarters and eventually gets written into the Zohar, et cetera, et cetera. The point is, the opinion that you should not wear tefillin on Cholomod is Davka, one section of a Bavli opinion. It's Davka, not an Eretz Israel opinion. Unfortunately, what you'll be told nowadays is that if oh, yes, if you were living in France, okay, maybe you can put on to fill in without a bracha or something. But here in Eretz Israel, the, min, the, the minag is, is not to wear um, uh, to fill in on Cholomoed. So you have here a clear example of people coming back to Eretz Israel and Davka not doing, Davka doing hafuch from uh, Torah Eretz Israel. Another little example is related to what we're talking about here is the Mishnah says, the Yom Tov Rishon Shel Hag you read from what is called um, Parshas Emor, um, according to the Bavli cycle. And in every other day of the Chag, you read the Korbanot of that day of Chag. And as the Tesefta explains, that means on day two, you read Uvi Yomashini, and on day three, you read Uvi Yomashlishi, and on day eight, Shemini Yatseret, you read Uvi Yomashmini. And that's also what the Yerushalmi says. Come the Bavli. The Bavli says, no, on Shemini Yatzeret, this is already an interesting thing. It says, on Shemini Yatzeret, you should read Kola Bachor, which is the end of what is uh, known as Parshat Re. Uh, and then here, because we have two days Yom Tov, you read, on the second day, you read the Zotta Bracha, uh, which obviously is based upon the practice that had already become prevalent in Bavli, in Bavel by that point of um, finishing and then also starting the Torah at, um, on, Shemini, on the second day of Shemini Yatzeret. 
And then subsequently, this whole festival of Simchat Torah, it's, you start seeing certain parts of it in the Go'onim, and then later on, more and more practices get introduced. And then this idea comes that even though the Mishnah says you're not allowed to dance on Yontav, you are allowed to dance on this Yontav. Um, and all sorts of very, you know, just objectively quite strange things happen that, you know, an ordinary person on Simchat Torah gets home at night, I don't know, many, many hours after uh, you normally normally get back on Yom Tov and you have some very truncated, unless you're super from, you have some very truncated suda, uh, and then you go straight to bed so you can get up in the morning to do more dancing, which also the Chor is Asa, whatever. Anyway, the point is that um, I'm not saying there aren't Heterim, but it, it, it's a strange thing. And what happened when Jews came back to Eretz Yisrael? Well, in the Chutzaretz, they had Shemini Yatzeret, which was a normal Yom Tov, and they had Simchat Torah, which was this kind of a bit of a strange Yom Tov. And I don't think it takes, a, you don't, it's not a, you don't take a genius to work out what's going on here. Two-day Yom Tov is not the easiest thing to do. It's especially not the easiest thing to do when you just did it for Rosh Hashanah, and then you did it for Yom Tov Rishon Shol uh, Hug, and now it's Shemini Yatzeret. And people everyone will admit this if they're honest, they get a bit bored. And so Simchat Torah kind of basically developed as something to do on day nine. But now, of course, that need is not there. Uh, it's, there's, there's nothing hard about keeping one day yomtiv. But no one even, even the word Shemini Atzara is kind of, oh, that's what you say in the Davani on Simchat Torah, right? Um, so what has happened is this Davka festival of Galut, of Bavel, and of the subsequent kind of post bavel tradition has become, what do you do in Eretz Yisrael? In Eretz Yisrael, you don't actually mean Yat Seret, you only have Simchat Torah. And you could pile example upon example. Um, and so to cap that off, you know, in this, in these circles, it's not a controversial thing to say, the Bet Mikdash is not going to fall from, a, from the sky. You're already sold on that one. That, and uh, I agree. Uh, Torah Eretz Yisrael is also not going to fall from the sky. Um, the fact that Jews came back to Eretz Yisrael and the minority of them that kept, kept the Torah Bechlal, Davka kept the Torah of Galus, and are not interested in exchanging it for the Torah of Eretz Yisrael is a reality. There's not going to be some sort of awakening that just happens, boom, from the sky. There very well may be, unfortunately, but it seems quite likely, a kind of a lot of falling off from certain sections of the Haredi world and certain sections of the Dati Lu'umi world. And if you've got a safety net ready to catch them, you might be in a position to catch them. But the basic point is that uh, Torah Eretz Yisrael is not going to come, it's not going to shoot out of the ground, it's not going to fall from the sky. It's only going to happen if you make it happen. And apart from every other reason why studying the triennial cycle is a beautiful thing, because it allows you to study Targum properly, because it allows you to study the Pasha properly, because it allows you to lane your own Pasha if you have it in Shul. It makes it a realistic thing to do, to do the normal, obvious thing, which is everyone gets up and lanes their own Pesukim instead of standing there while someone else lanes their Pesukim and maybe trying to whisper it along with them, but not too loud because then you put them off. Et cetera. Apart from all these other reasons why um, it's a beautiful thing to do the triennial cycle, it's also a nice concrete thing where you can say, this is something I do as part of Torah Derech Yisrael. And I do it with my Chabura, or I do it with my Chavrusa, or Imit Hashem Soon, I do it with my Shul. Um, and Baruch Hashem, on, uh, we were talking earlier uh, on WhatsApp about setting up in Yerushalayim, a Chabura dedicated to the Triennial Cycle. Um, go do it, set it up. No one's gonna stop. No one's gonna do this if if you don't do it. And if you don't do it, um, then I don't know what's gonna be. So do it. That's all else. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. We would also like to suggest the following opportunity to our viewers: If you identify with Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to sponsor or dedicate a video interview with the rabbi in honor or memory of a loved one. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org. If you are inspired by Rabbi Bar Chaim's message and would like to get involved in Torah Eretz Yisrael activities in your local area, 
Please fill out the relevant form by going to the link which appears on the screen.